Hey everyone, in this program, we're going to take a look at ancient Mesopotamia after the fall of the third dynasty of Ur, also known as the Neo-Sumerian Empire. It's this event, and the circumstances that led up to it, that started off what we call the Old Babylonian period. Now it's during this time that the city of Babylon went from being a provincial, let's say small city, to becoming the capital of the lands of Sumer and Akkad. Historians officially date the end of the Neo-Sumerian Empire at 2004 BCE. That's the year when the last king of the empire, Ibisin, was defeated and he himself, along with his capital city of Ur, were captured by the Elamites. After they fell, you had a bunch of successor states, many of which were really small fiefdoms. In some cases after the central authority of Ur was broken, the Ensi, or governor, took over and became king, founding a new dynasty. In other cases, Amorite tribes would take over, and like the Sumerian governors, form their own independent kingdoms and dynasties. Other areas were temporarily occupied by Elamite warlords, who eventually were kicked out. The first family really to rule over the ashes of the Neo-Sumerian Empire was the first dynasty of Isin. The story of this dynasty actually starts in the city of Mari, where its Akkadian founder, Ishbi Era, was originally from. It's said that he was a commander or general for the last Sumerian king, Ibisin. In fact, he's mentioned in a letter where Ibisin orders him to buy a large quantity of grain from the cities of Nippur and Isin, and to bring this to the capital city of Ur. Ishbi Era though replies that he's unable to because Amorites have been ravaging the country and blocked all of the roads to Ur. He also says that they're about to attack both Nippur and Isin, and asked to be formally made commander of both cities. Ibisin, whose Neo-Sumerian empire is crumbling and whose people are starving, doesn't have a lot of options. Nor does he have many commanders who are still loyal to him. Thus, he complies with Ishbi Era's request. He then tells Ishbi Era to team up with the other city governors in the region and to buy the grain at double the price if necessary, which he does. Ultimately, the grain reaches Ur. However, it's a small victory. As Ibisin's authority wanes, the power and ambition of Ensis such as Ishbi Era grows. There was really nothing though that Ibisin could do. All of his remaining resources and troops had been used sparingly to preserve whatever little territory he had left around Ur. Finally in 2017 BCE, Ishbi Era officially proclaims himself to be the new king of Isin and completely independent of Ur. And thus, the first dynasty of Isin was born. Other Ensis followed Ishbira's example, and within a short period of time, there were new little kingdoms and fiefdoms all over Mesopotamia. In 2004 BCE, the capital of the dying Neo-Sumerian Empire, the great city of Ur, was conquered and looted by the Elamite king, Kindatu. Ibisin was captured and taken back to Elam as a prisoner, and most likely executed. And this is how the Neo-Sumerian Empire and the Third Dynasty of Ur came to an end. Despite forming a new, independent dynasty, Ishbi Era and the later kings of Isin saw themselves as a continuation of the political, administrative, and cultural heritage of the Third Dynasty of Ur. For example, Sumerian still remained the language of all royal edicts and inscriptions, administration, and literature. They made it a point to keep as much continuity with the old order as possible. Another example of this is that the updated king lists of the time showed that there was no break between the two ruling houses of Ur and Isin. One king of Isin, Lepit Ishtar, the fifth king of the dynasty, had his law code written in Sumerian, just like Urnamu had done a century before. This code contained 43 articles whose laws mostly dealt with succession, property, and rules for slaves. Other kings of Isin had hymns composed in their honor and in a style similar to, and sometimes even plagiarizing, those dedicated to Shulgi, the greatest Neo-Sumerian king. In some cases, only the name Shulgi was switched with that of a king of Isin. What's interesting to note is that all of this was occurring 
despite the fact that Sumerian no longer was the common language of everyday people. By this time, most people in Mesopotamia spoke Akkadian. In fact, the kings of Isin were all native Akkadian speakers, plus they had Akkadian names. And yet, they continued many Sumerian traditions and imitated the great kings of the past. Another thing that the kings of Isin did, starting with Ishbiera, was to reclaim as much territory from the Elamites as possible. Ishbiera kicked out the Elamites from Ur eight years after its fall, and by the end of his reign, probably also ruled over the cities of Uruk, Larsa, and Iridu in the south, as well as Murad, Borsippa, and Kazalu in the north. These conquests, though, were often short-lived. Already by the reign of the dynasty's third king, Idin Dagan, clashes with Amorite tribes were resulting in losses. At one point, he lost control of the cities of Nippur and Uruk to various Amorite warlords, though he was able to get them back after launching a counteroffensive. However, during the reign of Enlilbani from 1860 to 1837 BCE, Nippur was lost for good to the Amorite kings of Larsa. So let's talk for a bit about Larsa. Like Yassin, it was a really old city that some believe dates back to the 4th or 5th millennium BCE. Shortly after the fall of the Neo-Sumerian Empire, Larsa was controlled by an Amorite ruling house that traced its ancestry back to a tribal elder named Naplanum, of whom we know little about. We do know that during the years 1941 to 1933 BCE, Larsa was ruled by a man named Zabea, who claimed the title Rabian Amurum, meaning Chief of the Amorites. His successor was a certain Gungunum, who ruled from 1932 to 1906 BCE and captured the great city of Ur during the seventh year of his reign. From that point on, Larsa rose and Isin declined. Due to the success of the Amorite kingdom of Larsa, other groups of Amorites were inspired to settle in the fertile lands of Mesopotamia, which ultimately created more Amorite strongholds and fiefdoms throughout the land. Between the years 1900 to 1800 BCE, the great Akkadian and Sumerian cities of Kish, Uruk, and Sippar had their own Amorite rulers. Interestingly enough, one would think that an influx of nomadic peoples such as the Amorites would have caused havoc for the urban population of Mesopotamia's great cities, but this doesn't seem to have been the case. Though maintaining their identity for a while, over time, Amorites were able to integrate themselves quite well into their new environment. One reason for this was that the Amorite language was fairly close to Akkadian, as both were Semitic languages. They also adopted the Akkadian script, since as far as we know, they didn't have one of their own. Their religion was also very similar to that of the peoples of Mesopotamia. They also worshipped many of the same gods and goddesses as the people of Sumer and Akkad. Thus, within a few generations, a new Babylonian civilization developed that was a mixture of Sumerian, Akkadian, and now a bit of Amorite culture, religion, and language. In the year 1894 BCE, an Amorite chieftain named Sumuabim conquered a small sliver of territory near Kish along the left bank of the Euphrates River and made one of its small cities his capital. In Akkadian, it was called Babilani, or Babilu, meaning the gate of the gods, or also sometimes translated as gateway to the gods. Most of us, though, know it by the Greek version of its name, Babylon. As Isin, Larsa, and the other Amorite strongholds began to fight amongst themselves, Sumu Abum was forced to take sides and enter the fray. He was quite cautious, though, and never created hostilities with others when diplomacy would do. Following his example, the first five kings of Babylon, through diplomatic, military, and marriage alliances, over the span of about 60 years consistently enlarged their realm. By the 1830s BCE, they had pretty much taken over Akkad and were making their way further south to the holy city of Nippur, which brought them into conflict with Larsa. The results of this particular conflict would change the face of the ancient Near East, 
and set the stage for the advent of one of the world's most fascinating individuals. We'll get into that and more in the next episode on the Old Babylonian Period. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And if you learned something, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.